Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. Dallas, Texas, it's Zola Levitt Live, featuring tonight Zola's teaching on the Abrahamic Covenant, the promise of God. Hello again, it's good to be back with you. Well, tonight is the first of uh, seven programs in a series called The Bible, The Whole Story. And uh, tonight, the Abrahamic Covenant, indeed, the, the most significant promise in the Bible, one uh, we're still living under. This program is dedicated by Christian friends in memory of Leslie C. Kessner. He's a man gone on to the Lord who just would have loved to have been up here telling you these things, and so we're telling you this, uh, these things for him. God's plan, you know, is continuous and logical through the whole Bible, from cover to cover, and the first major issue in the story of, of redemption is the Abrahamic Covenant. Uh, which we'll do tonight. I want to tell you what we'll do on all seven programs, from the Abrahamic Covenant to the Law, which is the second program, and then Prophecy, the Messiah, Grace, the Church, and the Kingdom. And if, if we can get all of those across, then I think we have, in a sense, covered the whole Bible, not in highest detail, but, you know, we're making notes available on what we say now. This has been a request right along, and uh, we're going to, to, I make notes to teach these things, and then I, uh, I have written them out in a readable kind of book form, and we've put the seven studies in a notebook for you. This will be our offering. Uh, the notebook has space for... Uh, the Levitt letter and the personal letters that uh, I write to you and uh, uh, possible future studies coming up. We'll also send you the current TV listings every 90 days. You'll automatically get uh, uh, any changes uh, of time, day, station, and so on uh, so that you can keep up with it. And uh, it begins the Bible, the whole story, and these studies will all be in here, uh, seven of them. And then in the back, there will be a space for uh, all the newsletters we send out. People have, uh, they do keep them and so forth, so this will be a handy place to keep them. And, uh, and then the personal letters that we send out from the ministry. So uh, the notebook, will, I, we, we need to ask for a gift of $20 uh, minimum, please, because uh, it's, it was rather hard to get together. When you get it, I think you'll see that it's uh, fine quality. And I'd like you to keep up with these studies. I'd like you to uh, read them even if you send uh, uh, right away, you'll be ahead of the next few programs and you can see beforehand what I'm going to say and, and uh, have your Bible open. And if you, if you own the seven studies long after the television programs are gone, you can still be reading them. You know, it, it, that is the one trouble with television. It just comes and goes in 30 minutes, and that's the end of it. Whereas uh, if you have notes like this in print so that you can uh, use them on and on, I think you can master these things. I so wish when I go to teach in the churches and so on that uh, the people understood issues of this kind. Well, the whole Bible then, uh, in the simplest form, tonight we begin with the promise, the covenant with Abraham. The 
Great Sea, the Mediterranean, and the Nile, the River of Egypt, and the lonely Sea of Galilee, the waters of the Bible lands. Paul and Barnabas sailed here, and Peter and John. Return with us to the blue waters and the clear skies of the biblical seas with Zola Levitt. This summer, you can study the scriptures with Zola where they were written. Several different tour combinations are available this summer, including the Pyramids of Egypt and the fascinating Cairo Museum, the Sinai, the Land of Israel in all its glory as we walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Jerusalem, the city of gold, Bethlehem, Nazareth, the garden tomb, the wailing wall, Then the beautiful Mediterranean, visiting the Isle of Patmos, the marble city of Ephesus, Athens, Corinth, the birthplaces of the Christian Church and the New Testament, a memorable summer cruise you won't want to miss. The Bible lands, beautiful, Historic, spiritual. See them this summer with Zola. For information, write Zola, Box 12268, Dallas, Texas, 75225. Well, here is a map of the Middle East with uh, no uh, modern boundaries on it, no city names, uh, pretty much the way a person in ancient times might have drawn the map. Uh, to orient you, uh, uh, over here is the Mediterranean Sea, and down here, uh, the land of what is now Israel, and, and uh, Turkey way up here, Mount Ararat, where the Ark settled finally. Uh, down here, the city of Ur by the Persian Gulf. Uh, to start at the beginning of the Bible, where was the Garden of Eden? Don't know, but it was somewhere on this map. Uh, it was somewhere inland from the Mediterranean Sea. And of course, after the flood, the ark settled up there to the north at the top of this map in Turkey. And uh, the people got off the ark and went uh, evidently south. Uh, the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 is the next interesting issue, I think. And, and uh, it was... Oh, somewhere in the land here, this massive uh, uh, desert and uh, uh, probably along in the Tigris-Euphrates uh, Valley, the Mesopotamian Valley, they call it, where there was fresh water. You see the rivers uh, go northward from Ur uh, in this direction. And so the, uh, they settled in the fertile valley and uh, avoided the, the desert, of course. And then... God didn't like it. He didn't like the Tower of Babel. It was a pagan shrine, really, and, and uh, he dispersed the people. You well know the story by confusing their languages. Babel in Hebrew means confusion. And uh, uh, some of them settled the city of Ur, which is right here at the top of the Persian Gulf, right uh, where the rivers come. So it's a nice fertile spot and a good harbor and a very logical place. You know, people who question the Bible used to say, well, where is Ur? Abraham is supposed to have come from the city called Ur of the Chaldees. Show us Ur and we'll believe the legend. And they went on that way right up until <laughs> Ur was found. And let me say this was some uh, advanced city. It had a wonderful university that was found, a library, cuneiform tablets with records of foreign trade and exchange and so on were found and uh, were read, and we know something of the culture of the people of that time. Then we're talking 4,000 years ago. But Ur is there, and, and the ruins can be examined. And, uh, you know, Abraham went with his family from Ur uh, to Haran, where his father Terah died, and then uh, he, he got to Haran, stayed a period of time. Haran is on a northern tributary, as you see there, from the Euphrates River. God spoke to him and wanted him to go to Canaan. That's the ultimate destination. And so they went south, and the route you see 
looks a little bit circuitous, but of course you wouldn't go from Ur and try and cross all these desert flats to go to Canaan. You would have, be obliged to follow that river and so that uh, uh, you'd have the fertility and so your animals could drink and so forth. So up to Haran and then down to Canaan is the logical way to go. It's fascinating, this journey from Haran to Canaan, the second part. It's very symbolic. It's a journey made by the Jew, Abraham, to possess the land, and then later made by the church, Rebekah, to marry the bridegroom. Think about it for a moment. Uh, the Abraham part is obvious. God said, get thee up and go. Go to Canaan. I'll give you the land, and so on. The scriptures we read at the top of the show. And uh, uh, the church, though, being Rebekah, Rebecca, like the church, will marry a stranger uh, because she has met the servant of the stranger and seen the gifts of the bridegroom. The servant is the Holy Spirit. He comes from the bridegroom and he woos us by showing us the gifts and so we are willing to follow the Holy Spirit and to marry the bridegroom we have not seen. Rebecca, in that sense, is a type of the church, and she traveled, too, from Haran. Remember, Abraham didn't want a Canaanite girl for, for his son Isaac's wife. He wanted somebody from Haran, from his own family, sent the servant there, and she was willing to travel back and marry the bridegroom. It's a, a very fascinating comparison, uh, as in the whole Bible. Uh, the Jew does it first, then the church does it, and the things that the Jew did, 1 Corinthians 10, 11, are for examples of for those upon whom the ends of the age are come, which is to say, examples for the church. Well, that's, that's the map of the time with, uh, with no modern boundaries to interrupt our, our view of things, and, and we can see just where Abraham went. Uh, God's command to him, what we call the promise, of course, uh, it begins in Genesis 12:3, uh, or 12:1 to 3, I should say. Those three verses are among the most important in the Old Testament. It's uh, uh, what I call the promise. It says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I'll make of thee a great nation, and bless thee, make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and so forth, as, as Don read at the top of the show. I'll bless, the, uh, bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee, this is very important, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Well, uh, and there's a lot of truth to it, and I could go on explaining those three verses, and uh, I should say subsequent verses, on and on through Genesis 13, Genesis 17, and so on, that amplify especially the land grant. I'm going to give you that land, Canaan. Uh, we can see it's still in force. Canaan, of course, is, is what they called Israel, well, I should say what they called Palestine before the Philistines started to call it that. But anyway, it's the promised land, the same land. And you know the promise, the covenant, is everlasting, forever. It's still in force and we're still living under it. And how can we prove that we're still living under it? Well, because this, the very people, the, the descendants of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob, through that uh, marriage of Isaac and Rebekah and so forth, are the people who are in the land. Canaan is possessed by those people. And I want you to think about the, the impact of, of a 4,000-year-old promise being restored in, in this generation, in this century, when we're alive. Uh, the very people come back and repossess the land. You know, of course, uh, the Jewish people were dispersed for a period of nearly 2,000 years. And the amazing part of it is, after all of that, they come back to take the land, and no other people in history concerning no other land ever did a thing like that. To realize the odds of that happening, say, here in America, we would expect that uh, after 2,000 years, the original Indian tribes who were here when we immigrants from Europe and so forth arrived and took that land, uh, are going to come back. In 2,000 years from now, there won't be a Dallas and a Chicago and a New York and a Los Angeles. Those are going to be Indian camps. <laughs> you say, well, it probably won't happen that way. It probably won't. And, and this shouldn't have happened either. When God picked out the children of Israel, uh, they were one couple. Abraham and Sarah. And then uh, at a later time when the promise was renewed after they uh, came out of slavery in Egypt, they were just one of a hundred marauding tribes in the Sinai. Uh, nobody special. 
In those days, everybody were the chosen people, if you know what I mean. They all thought they were the chosen people, and their gods were the real gods. So this promise uh, runs through the perishing of a hundred civilizations, including the Roman Empire, and brings us down to 1948, when the Jews did recover the land and repossess it, and then down to uh, 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 just a short time ago when Jerusalem's made the capital, and we're living in the fulfillment of that promise. Now let me say this, if the veracity of the entire Bible depended on this set of three verses, on this promise being fulfilled, nobody could doubt that the Bible's true. This isn't guesswork. This wasn't the writing of somebody who just predicts the future from a crystal ball. It's way too difficult uh, uh, to make such a prediction. Let me give you an idea of what the span of 4,000 years is like as against other countries' history. Our country, the United States of America, has been a country about 200 years. Uh, Great Britain, which ruled the empire upon which the sun never set, counts about uh, 900 years. Rome existed, the, the empire that dictated life and death to the known world, 2,000 years ago. That's only halfway back to God's promise to Abraham, I'm going to give you this land and you'll be a blessing to all nations and so on. That's 4,000 years, unparalleled. I don't care what people you mention and what part of their history you're not going to find a span like that of people observing the same religion, the same culture, and coming back to retake the same land. And this through uh, uh, the thousands of years, the millennia of occupation of the land by stronger foreign powers, uh, beginning with uh, 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 Nebuchadnezzar and, and, and the Persians and so on, through the Romans, through the Muslims, through the uh, uh, sundry Arabs, through the Turks, through the British, and finally back to Israel, back to the Jews. Uh, this, this through that much occupation, through the dispersion of 2,000 years, and they hung together and returned back, celebrating Passover, carrying the same Bible, singing the same hymns. Uh, through all the persecution in the foreign lands in all that time, and finally through the Holocaust, without peer. No other people has sustained the loss of 50% of their entire race. That is to say, in the Holocaust, 50% of the Jews of the world were killed. And they still recovered. The other half recovered to come back and possess the land. What for? Why did God pick these people and make them a remarkable promise like that? Well, they have a mission. First of all, he didn't pick them for their virtues. I, I would like to say that, being Jewish, but uh, it, it wasn't for the virtues. Abraham's life is one of, of many sins, if you read it, but also of great faith. Uh, his, uh, his faith was counted unto him as righteousness. But, uh, it, so it wasn't for their virtues, but because of a peculiar mission they had. The Messiah himself said, salvation is of the Jews. In John 4, when talking to the Samaritan woman, he told her, salvation is of the Jews. It's a remarkable statement. Uh, looking around today, we wouldn't say salvation is of the Jews. But in a, in a, in a very uh, clear historical way, if we look back, the missions that God sent the Jews to perform are very, very key ones. First of all, when God had the original problem with the Tower of Babel, it became clear he couldn't work with all peoples. They were just too pagan. Noah and his family were the only believers at the time of the flood, evidently. And now at the Tower of Babel, there was just one people to call on. In Genesis 11, where you read about the tower and all that paganism, build a tower to reach unto heaven and so on. Uh, when you read about that, at the end of the same chapter, you read about Abraham and his family. So to begin with, God chose Abraham to be the mission to the, to the whole world by God, so to say. He destroyed the tower, sent the people away, but said to Abraham, you get up and go to Canaan, I have plans for you. Then the plans become more clear as he starts to use, just here and there, uh, uh, the people of Israel to witness uh, out to the, to the Gentiles around, as when Jonah went to Nineveh. Uh, there, were, there were no people under the law in Nineveh. Nineveh was, was a, a Gentile capital, an interesting place, the fashion capital of its time, you might like to know. And uh, Jonah was sent there, and he was reluctant. Jonah was one of the most reluctant missionaries in history. Uh, he never liked fish again, but he did get to Nineveh. 
and he spoke to the people there and told them to repent, and somehow he did convince them to repent. Even the king uh, uh, came in sackcloth and ashes and repented of his sins when Jonah told him the word of the Lord. So that's a small instance of a mission by an Israelite uh, to the rest of the world sent by God. It's a very definite that Jonah didn't decide one night he really ought to go to Nineveh and tell him to repent, but God sent him. And then it reaches, of course, its ultimate fruition when Jesus, the Jew, comes to the whole world where God says, uh, uh, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. It's very clear, but, but the thing is, he's an Israelite. Uh, Jesus, of course, a carpenter of Galilee. I don't think it needs proving Jesus is an Israelite, but, but he was sent to the whole world. Now, he remained in Israel, and he witnessed exclusively to Israelites, but that was to arm people, to convert certain people, to send them forth. And then we see it really start to happen uh, in the book of Acts, in Acts 10, uh, Cornelius, the first Gentile to be witnessed to and brought to salvation, who was sent to Cornelius but Peter, uh, an Israelite to a Roman officer to tell him about salvation in the Jewish Messiah. So again, a Jew sent to convert the Gentiles. And then Paul, in a greater way, sent out into the empire. Oh, Paul had a tough mission. There weren't very many people in the empire. Uh, very interested in God or very interested in the Jewish Old Testament, which is all Paul had to bring them. And uh, yet he went forth and uh, through the enabling ministry of the Holy Spirit, he converted people right and left in the empire and built these marvelous churches. And without that particular mission, I dare say it would be difficult to get saved in the United States. We'd probably have to go to Jerusalem to be saved. Uh, Paul took it across the seas and then it continued on from there. And so it, it, uh, these are missions God sent Israelites to do. The remarkable thing is it's not over yet. The term salvation is of the Jews will reach one of its great uh, uh, fulfillments in the tribulation period when 144,000 people will be sent forth to tell the word. Revelation 7-3 uh, makes it very clear. And uh, uh, these 144,000 are clearly defined in that verse. They are 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. That's what it says. You know, I, I've had this argument time to time because there are certain cults that think they are the 144,000. And that's terrific. I'd like to be one of them myself. But uh, I'm going along in the rapture with you. I'm not waiting for the tribulation period. But the uh, 144,000 are defined right in that verse. I had a man say to me once on my... Uh, local radio program where people can call in. Why do you say that the 144,000 are Israelites? And I had to answer, I didn't say that. God said that. I'm just quoting that. And I read him the verse. He had never really even read it, and he thought he was one of the 144,000. No, again, it's a mission by the people God chose. And when did he choose them? But more than 4,000 years before that assignment, that difficult assignment in the upcoming tribulation period, it was when he made that promise to Abraham. That is the greatest meaning of you'll be a blessing to all nations. How can one people be a blessing to all nations? We Americans think we're a, a tremendous blessing to the nations of the world, and we've given a lot of technology and, and foreign aid and, and, uh, and so forth. We, we, we've sent some things abroad that we're pretty proud of, but you go around and ask the people of the nations how they like us. Oh, they don't like us all that much in every nation. Uh, I don't know how many folks we get uh, as being the great nation. But I'll tell you what, Israel, in its, in its peculiar way, has really blessed the nations by simply writing down the scriptures. You know, this is an Israeli book written and published over there by Jews. We've translated it to English for use over here. Uh, when you think about it, then that's a blessing. And the key blessing, of course, is bringing forth Messiah. Uh, it's usually said, my, they crucified him. Uh, he was crucified in Israel, was crucified by Romans. But uh, uh, the greater thing is some listened to him. Peter listened to him. Paul listened to the apostles. Uh, the disciples listened to him. Uh, Peter then could preach the sermon that's, that, that brought 3,000 people to Messiah and send them home to their uh, native countries all over the empire with uh, the obvious instruction, tell it like you heard it. The Roman in Latin, the Libyan in Libyan. The, the Macedonian in Greek. Go home and repeat it the way you heard us tell it to you in your own tongue. 
and thereby show the people that the Jewish Messiah is for them. Uh, they, really, they really were a blessing to so many nations because there's no greater blessing in life than the salvation in Christ. And so they took it. Scripture says, I'll bless them that bless thee and curse him that curses thee. God promised also that that kind of thing, and, and oh, it, it, historically it's been determined that way. The people that have blessed the Jews have reaped the blessing. The people that have cursed them have reaped some curses, and, and a reading of history will show that that's, that verse, Genesis 12, 3, has really been borne out as well. So what's the lesson in it all? Witness and reap. Uh, the problem with, with uh, uh, the salvation is of the Jew is today we've kind of let down and stopped witnessing to the Jew. Nobody can become a Christian and spread the gospel unless someone tells it to him. There are no born Christians. Uh, all the Christians have to be brought to the Lord one by one. So go to them. Go to your Jewish neighbors. Tell them the gospel. It's tough. Uh, uh, I think it's tough to witness to Gentiles to tell you the truth. I get nowhere with them. Uh, and and uh, you... <laughs> <laughs> you're being sent forth to witness to all men. You have to include the ones God shows. It just has to be. That's what I have to say on uh, Abraham and his covenant with God. It's all written down here in our notebook. Uh, the notebook is, is uh, uh, about the whole series, the Bible, the whole story. And uh, we'll have all seven studies in here. That's why I really want you to get it. And uh, there's a place in here to put... Uh, uh, the Levitt letter, the newsletter of our program. Everything is designed and tabs are made and so on to, for this to be uh, for your use. So a $20 minimum gift, please. And uh, uh, we'll send you the notebook and we'll be updating you on the TV times and so forth. Uh, write to us at box 12268, Dallas, Texas, 75225.